I'm going to give you an introduction to randomized algorithms. Um, sometimes we can just, you know, utilize the fact that we can just guess the right answer. <clears throat> and what we're going to do in general with randomized algorithms is set up scenarios where um, we can make some guesses and only keep sort of the good things and kind of discard the bad outcomes of the random, you know, either random uh, die roll or coin flip or whatever. <clears throat> um, sometimes guessing can be really powerful. It can be um, sometimes even more powerful than, you know, deterministically thinking through, say, all possible uh, combinations of something. Um, often randomized algorithms are pretty simple. Um, that's not always the case, but typically compared to the deterministic, uh, ver you know, uh, like the deterministic sort of corresponding algorithms are typically a lot simpler. Uh, the big thing is there's <clears throat> these are all going to be approximate, right? Because we're relying on you know random numbers or coin flips or something like this that you know we can't typically guarantee anything um, or maybe only guarantee some outcomes but not others. So it's always going to be sort of approximate. So randomized algorithms always have this explicit exchange between time and sort of a guarantee of accuracy or performance. So typically the more time you let them run, you know, either the, the better and better result you're going to get out of it, or you know, the higher and higher confidence you're going to have out, out of the procedure being correct. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to use, I think, a really good example for this class of algorithms is testing whether a number is prime. So there's this primality test. Um, <clears throat> a version of the algorithm I'm going to present is actually used quite a bit um, um, in, in practice. So the goal is you just have one number, some one this candidate number, and you just want to give a you know thumbs up, thumbs down, is this number prime or not? Um, <clears throat> why is this a thing? Well, cryptography requires sort of huge prime numbers uh, fundamentally in, in those algorithms. Um, <clears throat> so we want to be able to basically quickly verify if a number is or isn't prime. Again, the brute force would be check all the numbers between, say, 3 and the square root of n, uh, which you think, oh yeah, I could just write a for loop to do this. <clears throat> um, but if you're thinking about the size of the input being based upon the number of digits, then as you add a digit, well, you're, you're taking the the number of numbers you need to consider up by a factor of 10. So each digit you you know you tack on oh all the uh, the, the space of numbers you need to consider you know multiplies by 10. So that means the complexity is about uh, big O of 10 to the d over 2 um, because we only have to consider uh, up to square root of n. So that's that's exponential. That's not great. We're, we're going to find a way of essentially cutting out that time way, way down, um, but giving up maybe some chance of having a false positive, so saying a number is prime when it isn't. Um, and also, just a side note, this testing of primality is an example of a co-NP problem. In the past, I've talked about NP problems. These problems can be um, basically the answer to an NP problem can be verified in polynomial time. So you could say, oh, for an NP problem, there exists a solution that can be solved, uh, verified in polynomial time. Co-NP is, you, um, for a given solution to a problem, you should be able to dismiss all counterexamples in polynomial time. <clears throat> so you can see how pr uh, primality fits into this. Uh, the counterexamples would be all the possible factors for a number, right? So these are kind of core, uh, two different uh, theoretical sets of uh, problems. So this is just a nice example of this other set that's not quite as, so it's not as known, you know, in the popular mind of computer scientists. It's a little more theoretic. Anyways, how are we going to do this? There, we're going to of course borrow some uh, from number theory, uh, Fermat's lesser theorem. I don't know if. <laughs> if this is some sort of dig, I don't think so, <laughs> at Fermat, <laughs> his lesser theorem. Um, he used, of course, 
incredibly famous mathematician, arguably the best of all time. Um, I guess it's probably nice that to be such a good mathematician that you have work that's like, oh, this is this good stuff, and oh, this is just a lesser theorem. Or it's maybe they're, you know, the mathematicians are getting like hipster on us, like, oh, Fermat's early work was the coolest, and the later stuff's more too mainstream or something. I don't know. Anyways, this is <laughs> his lesser theorem. <clears throat> it's relatively straightforward. We have, it states, if P is a prime number, <clears throat> and we have this other number a that's between 0 and p, then this formula, a to the p minus 1 minus 1 mod p, should be 0. Note, if you're a mathematician, you're probably wondering this is not exactly how you've probably seen it stated. I sort of translated the formula um, into something that's a little more computer scientist friendly, um, with a little bit more familiar notation. <clears throat> But it, 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 is, it is, you know, true to the original. Um, so let's just consider this example. Um, for A is 2 and P is 7. So if we just, um, you can see 2 to the 7 minus 1, minus 1 is 63. And we can notice that 7 is a factor of 63. So that means 63 mod 7 is 0. So great. Works in that case. So I just want to make it a little more concrete for you. So this is, I'm going to refer to as you know, um, a, a single test of a, of a number, a candidate prime P. We'll, we'll utilize this um, in uh, just a few moments. <clears throat> so how are we going to use this theorem? Um, <clears throat> anytime you have this if-then relationship, if the premise holds, that means... If the number is prime, okay, then the conclusion is true. So that means if a number is prime, that theorem, so that formula holds. If it's composite, so if it's not prime, well, we don't know if that theorem really holds. In fact, it's, it holds sometimes, but sometimes not. So that means there are some numbers that are composite that you can plug into this formula and come up with zero for them. Some, some, for some, you know, composite P's, let's say. So using the contrapositive, so we say, we're just gonna flip the premise and the conclusion and say, well, if the theorem doesn't hold, so if we use that formula and we get a number that's not zero, then we know for sure the number is not prime. <clears throat> so that's just some basic, you know, basic logic. Um, <clears throat> So the, the, the long story short of this is we can, with a single test, we can quickly disprove if a number is prime, but we don't know the other way around. So it's, it's sort of this one-sided test where we can for sure come up, um, we can, if we can come up with a counterexample, we can, you know, we can disprove uh, a, a number's primeness, but if, but we can't really say anything about the other case. <clears throat> Um, so what does this look like? How are we going to use this sort of algorithmically? So given a number, we're just going to randomly pick a bunch of numbers smaller than it, but greater than zero. <clears throat> if any of those tests fail, so for all those smaller numbers we pick, if any of them fail, we know the candidate number is not prime. But if it survives all those tests, we'll, know, we'll, we'll likely believe the number is prime. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the actual algorithm here. We take n, that's going to be the candidate number, the number we want to determine is it prime or not, and k is the number of sort of samples or random trials we're going to run. We're going to start off assuming the number is prime, then for k times, um, so we're going to run for k times or until prime is, we, we've come up with a counterexample, so prime would be false. Um, so while for k times and is prime is still true, we're going to sample a random number, a, from the interval 2 to n minus 2. We're going to use the formula from Fermat's Lesser Theorem. We're going to check if that result is not 0, then we've discredited n. <clears throat> so we'll set is prime to false, then the loop will stop and it'll quit and return false. Now, if we 
go through this entire loop with that check, that Fermat's check uh, passing, <clears throat> then we can be reasonably confident that the number is prime. So um, I guess it's debatable whether or not you think this is simple, but at least this is not so many lines of code. You can imagine you write this up as actually would be simple to implement. So that we have sort of a del uh, delivery on the one point here of, um, you know, randomized algorithms are typically pretty simple. Let's look at the, the rest of the sort of uh, aspects of random algorithms. So this is, this simple algorithm has a false positive rate of <laughs> about one half, meaning um, about half the numbers you can pull out of the air. <laughs> <laughs> whether they're prime or not, or if they're not prime, will pass. Uh, mathematicians tell us that one set of numbers that will f dupe this test are called Carmichael numbers. Um, so we can add an additional check in there, which will drop the false probability rate to, or the false positive rate, excuse me, to that of um, one quarter. <clears throat> um, I, I did add that in just because I wanted to give you the sort of the essence of this algorithm and the and randomized algorithms in general. But we can see here if we just do a little bit of probability that if for k is 100, so for 100 tests of a single number, um, <clears throat> we can look at our confidence about um, the outcome. So again, if it says false, we know it's it's false. It isn't it isn't prime. So if it comes back and says true. What are the odds that it's telling us the wrong thing? Well, that's if it passes all the tests, but is composited, <clears throat> and that's gonna be the same as it passing a single test and is composite, but to the kth power, because they're all independent checks, which is going to be one half to the hundred. So that's a pretty small number. So even with a hundred tests, um, we we're, we're pretty confident about the conclusion and this also shows um, <clears throat> again the more confident we want to be we can just bump up K right or if we want to be faster we can just drop K down to a smaller number also with this check to right we'd need fewer fewer uh, checks to get the same level level of confidence <clears throat> so that's this that in the nutshell is the exchange of um, speed for accuracy or accuracy for speed depending how you want to think about it if you want to be more confident you run the test longer if you're okay with some risk then you run it less often that's that's randomized algorithms sort of in a nutshell I think the primality test is a good example um, we're going to take a look at some more uh, complex ones next time uh, thanks for watching